Hello, everyone. It's John Byrne with Poets and Quants. Welcome to Fridays with Sandy. Sandy Kreisberg, uh, hbsguru.com founder. Hi, everybody. Sandy here, re ready to go. We oh, have man. with us today Alejandra, and we are going to do a mock interview with her. Uh, she's interested in the deferred admissions program uh, of an elite nature. She is about to graduate from Imperial College London with a degree in biomedical engineering, which is pretty heavy stuff, right, Sandy? Yeah, that's impressive. Uh, uh, most schools are looking, most early admission programs like the two plus two programs at major business schools are looking for women and they're looking for STEM candidates. So you're, you're, so, so you're a double threat, Alejandra, you're, you're a STEM, you're STEM and you're a woman. And um, let me also add, you've got very impressive stats. We've got a three, eight at Imperial college and well, let's explore this. Uh, you listed your GRE score as in percentiles as 91 verbal and 75 quant. Are, are you thinking of taking that over? No, I've taken, I took it twice. Um, and that, that's as much okay. as I wanted to well, do. Well, here's living proof that people who score 75% quant are not, can also be very adept in mm. quantitative uh, work because you've got a powerful history of uh, bioinformatics and other things like with infomatics that I can't even pronounce. And, uh, and even having been a freelance writer on data science. Yes, right. Okay, so we're going to give you a typical uh, interview. Okay, you ready? Yes. Hey there, how are you? Could, uh, let's say it's the first day of class. Uh, and everyone's going around the room introducing themselves, you know, for like, you know, 30 seconds, a minute. How, 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 could you introduce yourself to your classmates? Yes. Um, so, hello, my name is Alejandra. I'm in my final year of biomedical engineering at Imperial College London. Um, I've spent four years there and um, outside of academia, I've also performed two internships. The first one was doing bioinformatics at Illumina. And the second one was doing graduate technology at um, Schroeder's Asset Management. Outside of work and outside of university. Um, okay, stop I, right there. How, how, how was that, John? I mean, good. It was a little, um, it was good on paper, but it was hard to take in. You weren't emphasizing things. You weren't setting stuff up. It just looked like you were reading off of uh, your own rap sheet. This is important. The way you, a more effective way to introduce yourself is to say, you know, hi everybody. My name is Alejandra. I was, and then quickly say, I was born in blah blah. I went to. Uh, right now, I'm attending college at Imperial College London, and I've had several work internships that I'd like to tell you about. One was at a company called Schroeder's, which is a multi. You get the difference. Yes. <laughs> John, you get the difference. <laughs> this is educational for you, too. Well, it's more, it's more casual. The other thing I like about saying where you were born is because you're in London now, and it gives a sense that you're... Yeah, you blah, know, blah, blah. Okay, Alejandro, let's, let's hear it. Hey there, how are you, Alejandro? Could you, could you introduce yourself to your classmates? Yes, hello. Um, I'm Alejandra. I was... Um, born in Spain and then lived in Chile and Brazil. Currently I'm in London because I'm finishing my final year of engineering at Imperial College. And outside of university, I've done an internship in bioinformatics at Illumina and also I've done graduate technology at Schroeder's. That doesn't mean anything to me. You, you've, you've got to present the jobs. You have to do a whole dog and pony show. I've had a couple of internships. Uh, the, the first one was, was at a company called Illumina which is a blah, blah company. And while I was there, I got the chance to do blah and blah. You get the difference? Okay. Yes. Yeah, it's okay. a level of detail. Detail as opposed to just a line in a resume. Okay, understood. Well, it's detail, it makes it, it, makes it comprehensible. People, mm -hmm. never, most, people don't know what Illumina is, so that you've lost them right there. And then tell me, bioinformatics. I'm good. Let's do this one more time. This is critical. For anyone out there facing an interview, at a leading business school, 
you've got to be able to introduce yourself and you've got to be able to walk through your resume. The, the questions come in different forms, but you, you really have to master that little dog and pony show. Okay. Yeah, so, so assume okay. everyone doesn't know what these companies do or what you, and what you mm -hmm. did. Uh, and and uh, you know, while that term um, is familiar uh, to you, it's not familiar to a lot of people. Understood. Let's try it again, okay? And then, then we'll get off of this and just everybody remember okay. this is important, okay? Hey, yes. Alejandra, how are you? Uh, boy, could you could you introduce you? How how would you introduce yourself to your classmates? Yes. Um, hello, uh, my name is Alejandra. I was born in Spain and then grew up in Chile and Brazil. Currently, I'm in London, where I'm studying my final year of biomedical engineering at Imperial College. Um, I've also done two internships. The first one was doing bioinformatics for a company called Illumina. They do whole genome sequencing and they're actually the world leader in it. Um, and that means they sequence people's genomes and help healthcare in that, in that way. And the second internship was doing technology at Schroeder's where I made a couple of dashboards that would help investors understand better the data that they were dealing with. The Schroeder's part was incomprehensible because you never told us what they do. Ah, they do um, asset management. Okay, yeah. But otherwise, you know, the detail was very, very helpful because it gave us an understanding of what you actually did during your internships mm -hmm. there. Okay. And, and, and I had no idea that uh, Lumina was, a you know, the largest genome company in the world. I had no idea. So that's, yeah. that, that immediately elevates its importance on your resume, incidentally, okay. besides being clearer. Yeah, good point. Okay, uh, let's go. This is the frequent um, mock, mock, mock interview question. Uh, tell me about uh, Imperial College. Why? Wh this is a this is a critical question, mm -hmm. particularly for two plus two kids, but for everybody. Why? Why did you go to Imperial College? Well, tell me. Tell me about your decision making process when you chose Imperial College. Yes. So at the time of applying, I was living in Brazil and I always had this very clear idea in my mind that I wanted to study in Europe, always. And so at the moment of choosing which university to apply for um, or which university to accept, um, Imperial stood out to me because it only teaches STEM subjects. So it's extremely specialized. Um, it's located in London, which I love. Hey, hey how's she doing, John? Uh, I think it, that all makes sense to me. What, what, you, she, does she have to say that Imperial is the MIT of Europe? No, you have to um, contextualize it more. You have to say, I went to, if someone says, how did you choose Imperial College? The answer is, I went to high school in blah, where, wherever you went, okay? It's an academically oriented high school. When it came time to choose college, I spoke about uh, where I might go with my parents, with my college advisor, and with, I, I, and of course, with friends who have been attending college. Okay. So then what happened after that? Did you know anyone who went? Th this is real important. The best answer for why did you choose X college is, I don't know if this is true, but this, this is a great answer. I, I was going to school. I, I was going, I went to an academically oriented high school. I had, I had a friend who went there and I actually spoke to her. My advisor said that that would be a good choice among this, this, and this, blah, blah, blah. You, you get it? Can, yes. you, can you explain it that way? Except it, it wasn't that way for me, so I didn't know. Yeah, well, whatever the truth is. <laughs> um, so, so then, so. Let me yeah. ask you, did you know anyone who went there? No. Wow. Okay. But you knew of the school's reputation, yes. which was excellent in Europe for science, STEM. Absolutely excellent. It's, and many people do consider it the MIT of Europe, in fact. Yeah, we, we don't care about that. What we care about is her decision to go there. <laughs> so so when, I, when I meant the MIT of Europe, for me, it means more than that. It, because of the quality of the research and the professors, yes. Yeah, they don't care about that. They want to know why you went there. So, so I was going to high school wherever. 
uh, I didn't have a lot of resources. I, uh, uh, my friends had gone to colleges like an A, B, and C. I knew I was interested in this. Imperial got on my radar this way. I, I would have liked to have visited, but I couldn't. So I did a lot of homework. And what appealed to me was this, this, and this. And then were you interviewed by them or what? I was not interviewed. So I applied and then I had to do a, a math test to get in. Yikers. Okay. Wow. So the first time you went as a student, you had never been there before, right? So when I got, when I got accepted, I was in Europe and I went to visit. Um, okay. But only after I knew I was going there. So it, yeah, I was committed at that point. That's great. Okay. Well, good. <laughs> anyway, it's real helpful to have a wrap about how you chose mm -hmm. your college. Then they have another frequent question is, after all that homework and blah, 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 what, what was unexpected once you got there? What was unexpected about Imperial? Um, so going back to the idea that because all of my friends were studying STEM-related degrees, the conversations that arose from that were very, how to explain this in, in, a, in a nice way, you would think we're all nerds and in some ways we could be, but- yeah, I, That I understand. Why was that unexpected? What had you been expected that you were gonna go to uh, uh, the Imperial it was, College it of was London in biomedical engineering and deal with Hollywood models and athletes? No, no, it was unexpected because nobody tried to hide the fact that they loved math. And nobody tried to hide the fact that they enjoyed what they were studying. And this was something that I thought going into fully STEM perhaps would be different. But the passion okay, that uh, I saw in uh, people was uh, uh, very that's, strong. That's an acceptable answer. And what pushes it over the top is it's enthusiastic. So they'll get they'll go, boy, this gal is really uh, interested in this and, and the fact that she got to this place and everybody else was interested in it. We, we like her. And you know what the rap is in high school. If you're, if you're into deeply into math or science, you're immediately labeled a nerd. Where here you have total embrace and acceptance by everyone because everyone's in the same boat pursuing the same type yeah, of Yeah, so the answer is what was unexpected is that it was, it was not only nerdy in a good way, but they were, everybody talked, everybody loved talking about science mm -hmm. and nerd issues. Uh, it was unexpected on the plus side. It was yeah, great. It's probably one of the things I'm going to miss when I leave actually, is the fact that uh, I was, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Good, good. Uh, okay, here's another typical question. Um, tell me about your job at Schroeder. Basically, you should be able to do this with every everything on your resume. Why did you work? What did you do? What is Schroeder's? What did you do there? Yes. So the team that I joined is called um, Quantitative Trading and Quantitative Investments. So they deal with portfolios that are traded automatically. And this means that they don't get... they get to start with what is Schroeder's. Ah, Schroeder's is an asset management company. I apologize. In, in the UK, it's known, but obviously in America, it's not. Sure. So I need to account for that. Yeah, sorry. Um, so my job within this team was to create... You should, have, you, you, you should do a better job of defining Schroeder's. You should go. Schroeder's is an asset management company. It's very well known in Britain. It is then just try and define it in some way. It's a generalist okay. approach. It's got, ex, if it's not pub, private information, it's, it's publicly traded, right? Yes. Okay, that's important. You go, Schroeder's is a publicly traded asset management program on the what exchange? Uh, ooh, London stock, I think. Yeah, on the London exchange, uh, it is, uh, you know, like a Fortune 100 financial company or just have some easy metrics to let us know it's like a really big company. Okay. Okay, so that's Schroeder's. I joined them as a software engineering intern. And then they'll, yes, they'll say, yes. well, so you're, what, what does that mean? So um, it means that I joined a team of software developers and together they were building 
dashboards and metrics that would help the portfolio managers understand what was happening with the assets and be able to make decisions accordingly. Yikers. Uh, how, how, did you, uh, how did you get that job and why did you accept it? Um, I got that job because this is a company that values a lot of diversity in their employees. And because I came from a bioinformatics background, I could code, but I could also bring sort of a healthcare perspective into the job. Well, tell me about how they got on your radar and how you got onboarded and how you started learning about them. And that's a very good question. So I had done a previous work experience completely remotely um, for a year, which was very long for me. And this internship was advertised as going into the office, which for me was a direct sell. I, I wanted to interact with people and I wanted to have meetings in person, so. Yeah, okay, so, 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 so far all you've said is, one thing I liked about it was it, was, it, was, it wasn't working remotely, okay? Mm -hmm. But that, that's true of a whole bunch of jobs. Tell me more specifically about you and Schroeder's, how you found out about it, how, were they advertising? Did you see them present at a forum? Did you have a friend who worked there? Mm -hmm. So I knew of Schroeder's because they are a very big asset manager in England. So they were on my radar already. They also have a very, very strong and respected graduate program. So if I went into the internship and then I got a return offer, I would be able to join the graduate program. Yeah, so that's reason, important. Yes. They're well known. They've got, an, they've got a very well structured um, um, internship program that in, in many cases leads to a full time offer. Yes. Those two things, well-known, internship program, what else? Another thing I can add is that unlike many other um, banks or asset managers um, worldwide, they have an extremely high employee satisfaction rate, extremely high. And um, having worked How, how there, did you know about that? Well, well I did research and I, I, I like what their job was and I like what their focus was. And they also have a very high employee satisfaction. Yes. Did you know anybody who worked there? No. What was the, what, so how did, did they advertise for a job or did you knock on doors or what? How did you make um, contact? They advertised the internship um, online or maybe through an email that I received. And so I decided to apply. Yeah. And then what happened? And then um, I had to do again some math or coding test. And then was the interview. Interesting. What was the interview like? The interview is called an assessment center. I don't know if it's called the same in, in America, but they have a bunch of applicants and they put us in a room together and we have to discuss a case and they want to see the team dynamics to, to understand. Uh, yeah, that's happen. the way Wharton works, doesn't it, John? Yeah. Yeah, so this um, is uh, rats in a barrel. <laughs> what yes. was that like? Um. Did anybody it, really, well, of course, everybody goes in there and they say, okay, rule number one here is don't be a jerk. Yes, everyone was, was very nice. Was anybody a jerk or was everybody no. well behaved? Everyone was very nice, but it was, it was like competing for airtime in the most polite way possible. Very, yeah. very English, British culture, I have to say. <laughs> um, yes, very, very interesting experience. Here's a question that's often asked that people scratch their head about. Why do you think they hired you? I think they hired me because I answered one question really well. And I remember this because the interviewer said it was a good answer. She asked me why I wanted to join Schroeder specifically. And I talked about the ratio of men to women in the board of directors. And I had some specific examples there. Um, and she really saw that I, that I did my research and she was happy there. That's, that's a great answer. And it's good advice to all our uh, viewers out there. Do a little research, when, particularly if you're in one of these uh, uh, rodeos, uh, rodeo playoffs, where you, you, there's eight of you in, a, in an interview room. Good. Uh, what? Um, here, here's a question they do ask. Um, you know this analysis, uh, what's it called, where opportunities, threats, SWAT, strengths, yes. weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Could you... Could you just do a quick version of that about Schroeder's? Um, all right. So strengths, very loyal employee base 
And they're, they've existed, I think, for 200 years now. So a huge history. They're a very long-standing company. They are robust, I would say. That would be the strength. The weakness would that's be... Not a, that's not a good example of strengths. You, you want to talk about strengths within their industry. They're well-positioned. Their products are this. Their market is this. Their market is growing. Their competitors have made gaffes in the past. That's a company's strengths. They've got a very uh, powerful executive team. They, they've, got, uh, they've got the most advanced technology of all asset managers. I'm making this up, but those are strengths. Do you, you see what I'm getting at? I understand. Um, I don't know the answer to most of those, but what I can say is that he has, the company has very strong leadership with the CEO, Peter Harrison. He's been there for, I think, eight years now. He's extremely respected in the company. Um, so strong leadership. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's good. But try, try and get more of the industry. You know, it's just mm -hmm. strengths is what it is, what, what it's, what its products are, what, what its profit centers are, whether it's growing, what, what the macro world, how they fit in with macro trends, mm -hmm. uh, blah, blah, blah. That's real important. You, you should know about the company. Okay. Something a lot of people don't know. Uh, Okay, what, what, what are its uh, weaknesses and uh, uh, weaknesses? Weaknesses, I would say perhaps is, um, I, I love the company, so it's so difficult for me to think of this, but it is a good question. Um, weaknesses perhaps would be, they had a lot of systems that were old fashioned and I could see a transition happening towards new systems. And I okay, that's a perfect answer. They were a little behind the curve in terms of technology. The end, right? Okay. One of their weaknesses is they, they were a little behind the curve in terms of adapting to technology. And, and now that they've joined the race, they're behind some of their competitors. Uh -huh. That's accurate. Yes. Good. W what are their opportunities? Opportunities? Um, I would say is developing much more online applications and being able to target younger audiences. I think because of their history, their main clients are insurance companies, pensions, and then very wealthy families, what we call private wealth. Mm -hmm. um, I wish- So they're this mostly, this phrase B2B, or is that not accurate? Business to business? Um, I would say so, yes. Business to business. Yeah, yeah they, a, a lot, of, most of their work is business to business. That's. That's an important part of a company's identity. Mm -hmm. Schroders is a publicly listed finance management company. It's on the London Exchange. Its ticker symbol is SH. They're mostly business to business. That's a good way to start the answer to tell me about the company. You get it? Okay. Yes. Do you have yes. any idea of like how, how many um, professionals that are employed? Ooh, it's not a big company in terms of number of employees. I would say a couple thousand, not more. Yeah, well, that's that's because of the technology and that's the way it works. It's 5,500. Uh, Thanks, John. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, have John in your, have John connected with some Dick Tracy device when you have your actual, if you have an actual interview. Good. What, what um, okay, and then who are its competitors? Competitors would be, I would say, foreign asset managers that are coming into London or they are trying to expand into Asia now, actually. And going abroad for a company that is very English, like Schroders, must be a threat. An opportunity, but could also be a threat. Well, what, what question did you think you were answering? Threats? Who were their competitors? Yeah, so the answer would be Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, J.P. Morgan mm, okay. Chase, e Bank, that John, kind of Bar Barclays, those kind of companies. Hey, John, I appreciate playing good cop, bad cop, but you're not you're you're not good cop. You you've become her dad. Okay, let's uh, just uh, keep uh, it at good cop, bad uh, cop. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, who are its competitors? That's something you should know. All right. And, and then, you see, the competitors lead to the threats. Okay. So, so I guess what I meant by my answer was they are well established in the UK, so I'm not concerned about their competitors locally. Now that they are moving abroad, foreign competitors, which I don't know the name of, I should, could become a real threat. Good. Okay. Uh, 
Tell me about, uh, let's, let's deal with bioinformatics at Illumina. You were an analyst there. It was a yes. summer gig. What, what is Illumina? How did you get the job and what did you do? Yes. So this was actually a, a one-year placement. So it, it was long. It was one year. Um, How did you decide, was this, did you take a year off? or? This is part of my degree. Um, we do three years of undergrad, a placement year, and then we come back for the master's. And it, it personally, it bought me some time to really think, what do I want to do? What are the skills I really want to develop? Okay, that's a kind of a one-off thing. So yes. if, just you, 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 tell me about Illumina. You go, well, my program has a one-year placement as part of getting, it's a, it's a five-year master's degree, is that it? Mm -hmm. So Illumina was my one-year placement. The yeah. end. What is Illumina? Illumina is an American company founded 15 years ago. They are the world leader in whole genome sequencing. And their main products are the machines that do the genome sequencing. And now they have also entered the software world where they sell software products to analyze data, to analyze genomic data in some. Good. Okay, here's an, here's an impossible question. Tell our folks what genome sequencing is for mm. dummies. All right, so this is a good question. Um, every person is unique. What makes them unique is that they have a set of genes. A whole set of genes of a single person is called a genome. So I have a genome, you have a genome, John has a genome. And whole genome All sequence- God's children got genomes, that's great. <laughs> there we go, yes. And animals and plants and viruses. Yeah, and not only that, right, yeah, good point. Yes. Um, so, so whole genome sequencing is a technology that allows us to sequence from number one, until the very end. And it's been challenging and the technology has taken a long time. And Illumina really was the first one to market this technology at a very high quality. Yeah, you're kind of drifting. Uh, to, the question was, what you know, difficult, what, what is a genome? And mm -hmm. uh, you, you should have a, your answer was uh, a low pass. You, you should have a better, you should look it up on Wikipedia. Okay. Or, and I'm not kidding and have a real dumbed down, but accurate answer. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yes. It's good. Uh, what, what, what um, how would you compare, th this is one of their uh, favorite culture uh, questions. How would you compare the cultures at Schroeder's and Illumina? All right, so starting with Illumina, chronologically, the culture that I perceived, again, working from home was very much. Yeah, that's a good point. I was working from home, but uh, what did you pick up even th that, that way? Yes, I picked up that if you want something, you need to ask for it. it and, and when you ask for it, it will be discussed, but it was not a culture that made things happen by itself. People had to move. It was very action oriented. Okay, that's um, good. That that's a uh, good that's one good answer of how you describe a corporate culture. For our folks out there in the vapor world, one of the ways that schools look at cultures is that the either culture is either flat or hierarchical or someplace on a spectrum between being, you know, very flat like a startup culture almost where you know, there's only five people and they all know each other, to being very structured, like you're, you're working at the Vatican or something, okay? So when, when, if you're asked a question, how would you describe the culture? Using that kind of terminology, how would you describe the culture? This company, Illumina, I would say was hierarchical um, in the sense that when I, it was a whole year placement, there was time and space for me to move or try different things. And this was not possible. And I asked for it politely. And then I asked for it politely again. And it, it was impossible. I had my position and I couldn't move. So the culture was flat, in my opinion. Okay, Sorry, so, they didn't, so do you think that was wise on their part? Or, you know, they said, well, you know, we don't care about you, lady. You're just here to help us. We're not here to help you round out your education. You're here for a year. We're paying you, and you're going to do what we want. 
I think I think I, I disagree with that view partly in that staying in my position allowed me to learn a lot and leaving towards perhaps something that I was more comfortable in or something that I was more interested in would have been the easy way out. So sticking the job was a huge learning experience for me. In terms of how much yeah, you're, I you're, delivered- you're, you're, It's not important. We're not quite answering the question I'm interested in. I, I think the answer is they're very structured. It was a very structured culture. Yes. There wasn't room for initiative. There wasn't room for suggestions. They had a, a very structured culture. And um, uh, do you think it worked for them? Or do you think they're missing out on something? I think it, I think it works for them, whether they're missing out or not. Um, my personal opinion is perhaps yes with interns because it's a extremely interesting industry. Why not move around? Um, but they've got a job to do, right? So, so whatever works for them. You're not committing to an answer. I don't think I have one, to be honest with you. I think it's a good question. <laughs> okay, a good answer would be, it works for them because the, the way they make money is by this. And it, that what they have to do is put all their resources almost in a, the mm -hmm. tip of the spear and everything has to lead to that. Yes. So they have to be structured. That's the way they operate. That's the way they make money. And it's been successful. Mm -hmm. You know, how now, of course, anytime you operate that way, there's a danger that the world will pass you by. That's yes. life. On the other hand, if they were loosey goosey, there'd be a danger that they wouldn't be making as much money. So there's mm -hmm. no right answer. But right now, I think it works for them. Yes. Um, once again, I, I don't know if that's true, but that's an answer. Okay. You, you spent uh, uh, a fair amount of time at an, uh, a company called Ultrasound Laboratory for Imaging and Sensing. What, 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 what were you doing there and what is that? So that was a project I did alongside my third year at university. So I was a student and also working in this. It was a team project. We were, were, you in, were you were, Did you go visit them or were you working through the computer screen, whatever they call that? What it, what, no, it, it was, it was um, at Imperial. So it was a lab at Imperial. Ah. Um, um, and so, say that. Okay, yes. So what we were doing there was in two parts. We created simulations by going into the lab and then we analyzed those simulations computationally. The aim of the simulations was to um, identify problems in medical imaging, if I have to explain it in a very baseline level. You do, but you haven't. So so can I try again that? Am I confusing you with someone? Are you the one who identified ways to find dangerous particles on x-rays? So, what we were doing was when we get an ultrasound image, we know that there are inaccuracies in that image, like something could be distorted. So this is called an artifact. We yes. went into a very controlled environment in the lab where we created these images. We knew what the image was supposed to look like, but computationally, we compared it to what it actually looked like. And this is how we yeah, tried so to- Yeah, so we, we, we had a gizmo where we, we could, you know, we, we, when you get an ultrasound image, it, it, it's often only 95% accurate due to a lot of reasons that I won't go into. And what we did was we had a technique to make it 99.9% .9 accurate. Yes. Does that work? You explain it much better. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what we were doing, yeah. Good, and what, what, what were you doing? So in this project, I was leading the simulations. I was doing the, the coding part of the, of the project. This, this group was very interesting in that we had students from medicine, students from computer science, and everyone was owning on their own skills. Good, so uh, what, what, and what was the culture like? The culture was very flat in this case. We had a leader that liked to ask for everyone's opinion before making a decision. And in a group of eight people, there were a lot of opinions. Ha, and, ha, ha. and so, so does that work? Was that, was that 
did anything ever get done or was that yeah. actually workable? Um, things did get done. Yes, we, we finished the project successfully. Whether it was my preferred um, management style, I would say no. Um, but yes, things did get done, absolutely. Good. Okay, here's, here's a question. Who's the best leader you ever worked for? I would have to say my boss at Schroeder's was an extremely good mentor and teacher during my time there. And what made him a good leader mentor? I think he, from day one, said to me, you are here to do a job and produce code. But that is 50%. The other 50% is that you learn. And I don't mean like, oh, learn. I mean, learn. So whenever we had meetings, we'd spend 50% of the time on code. And the other 50% was asking, what have you learned? What is this word? Describe this concept. Who did you speak to? You know, and, and that 50-50 partition was just the best way for me to Good. okay here's it. here's a here's a complex question w what do you need in terms of personal growth and job experience to become a leader like the guy you just mentioned what do i need i need an environment where i'm working towards a vision so i really want to be and that's all gauze one of the things I need would be three different jobs with, with cross-functional teams. So I learned how to lead different people in different ways. Another thing I would lead would be, need might be another mentor. And another thing I would need is just, you know, six years of uh, sub-leadership experience so I could build my confidence. You get the difference? Yes. You don't seem convinced. Yeah. No, I, I, I mean, guess, I'm make, I, I mean, that's the I don't your version like I of that. Use that answer, though. I don't see whether I could produce that answer. Why not? They're asking you to make stuff up. <laughs> I suppose so. Yes, I suppose. Um, I can't envision it in in the sense that I don't see myself today leading a team and so therefore I wouldn't know how to put that in an answer if that makes sense. It makes sense. Let me give you some advice. Mm -hmm. John, tell her what I'm about to tell her. Well, you have to have a vision for your future and what you want and this is part of it, really. Okay. If you want to achieve what your uh, role model yeah, is. If you, if, you, if, you can't, if you can't give them a vision for what you want to do, if you can't imagine it, if you're too scaredy cat to say it, Forgive me, but you're going to have a don't 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 tell that to business schools, okay? They, mm -hmm. they, they don't like people like that, even though they like everybody. Even though they like everybody, they they, they like people like that the least. <laughs> I'm, uh, John, we need some more uh, nice nicitude here. Am I tell her why I'm right? Well, even though a lot of people who go to business school don't know exactly what they want to do, business school wants them to know it and tell them. Uh, and they want them to have a sense of what it's going to take to get there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because even if you can even say I'm tentative about it, but right now, uh, well, here's a question. Describe, and you need an answer for this. Describe your, describe your career after business school. What would be a good first job for you? What would be a good second job? And tell me, where you see yourself at the uh, acme of your career. All right. So after business school, a good job or a job that I would like to go into is probably managing the sales or managing a product that is working in personalized medicine. And by that, I mean in genomics. I really feel like genomics is the future and I'm going to be working in that sector. Okay. That's an acceptable answer. A, a great version of it would be a good job for me after business school would be a pro product, product manager. That's a term of art. Okay. I mean, that's like a real term of art that they understand and you understand. So you don't have to explain that. Would be a product manager at a company like X or Y. Like a great job for me would be a great starting job would be a product manager of the X product at company Y. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
and what's a good second job? A good second job after that perhaps would be to lead the strategy of where not the product, but the line of products or the strategy of the growth of the company is going towards. And by that, again, I mean expanding genomics because it's still a, in a field that is growing. Helping that growth would be very rewarding. Yeah, let me ask you a real uh, difficult question. What could yes, you see please. yourself doing if it wasn't in genomics? Oof. If I wasn't in genomics, I think, considering the job offers I have now, I would probably go into technology, into software development, and I would hopefully become CTO of a company one day. That's a, great, <laughs> that's a good answer. Okay. You, you, they don't like you to be 100% sure about what you're going to do, although it's okay to say I've got a history in this and I'm very interested mm -hmm. in this. They want you to approach this with a slightly open-minded point of okay. view. And they, 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 what, what, they, what they want you to do is to tell them what your skill sets are and where the, what industries those skills could be applied. Mm -hmm. So that's good advice for everybody. Okay, here's, here's advice to you and advice to everybody else. Name someone you admire uh, that we both know, not, not Barack Obama. <laughs> okay, well, I hope you both know um, of Ellen MacArthur. She was a woman who sailed around the globe setting the fastest record. She did so in 2015. She sailed what around- What do you, I'll, I'll, I'll buy that. What do you admire about her? The fact that, to be honest, the fact that she did it, and she was the first one, I think is very commendable. Um, so I'm a sailor myself, so it, it hits home, but I admire that tremendously. So How she, much do you know about her? Um, Ellen MacArthur? Yes. So she's English? A better answer, that's an acceptable answer. I admire Ellen MacArthur, who was the first woman to solo sail around the world. I'm a sailor myself. What I particularly admire about her is that she didn't start sailing until she was X years old. She, she had an accident that she recovered from. Uh, she was also, what I also admire about her was she was able to raise money to do this by running a brilliant marketing campaign. Okay. And, and what I also admire about her is, you know, I'm a sailor myself, boy, that's hard to do. And what, you, 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 you could become seasick, you could be, get lonely, uh, you know, it takes a lot of, yeah, and you could sink. Yeah, right. And you could die, right. Okay. okay. Understood. So, so what everybody needs are three people that they admire, not Barack Obama, in general. Mm -hmm. And then, because sometimes the question is, tell me someone we both know, okay? So I didn't know her, but that's my fault, all right? I'll give you that as an answer there. And then sometimes the question is, who's the best person you've ever worked for? Or tell me three people in your industry that you admire. So the best person I've ever worked for was yeah, my voters, yes. And then three people in my industry that I admire. Um, so one person I admire, I've never met them, but the CEO of Illumina. When I was working at Illumina, a very big acquisition took place. They purchased um, Grail, which you might have heard of. Um, they're doing extremely cutting edge genomics. It was a 7 billion acquisition, so it was expensive. Um, but how is this responsive to the question? So, so the fact that the CEO had the guts to do such a big acquisition and really say, and really buying into this is where the company is going um, was extremely impressive. How gutsy, how risky and gutsy a move was it? Being at the company at the time, a lot of the employees didn't think it was going to happen or didn't think okay, it was a good that's, idea. That's a good answer. Uh, okay, John, you, you want to finish out here? Something you, you want to ask her some questions or wrap this well, up? I'd, I'd ask her the penultimate question, which is why do you want an MBA and, uh, and why are you so directed 
at this age to get one? That's a very good question. Um, so having worked um, in genomics and I'm now doing my final year project in genomics as well, um, I really believe in personalized medicine and I think it's going to revolutionize healthcare for the better. So um, after graduating from Imperial in a couple of days, I want to work in bioinformatics and I want to gain more knowledge on the industry, not only technically, but in a wider perspective as well. And then gaining an MBA would really allow me to then work, move from the technical aspect to the management aspect. And considering the impact I really want to have in, in, in this industry, um, an MBA would be the stepping stone towards, towards getting there. Yeah. You know, a, a great way to answer that question is to have a role model. Do you know anybody who's done a path similar to that? Um, I know the CEO of Illumina did an MBA at Stanford, but I yeah, didn't that's know. that's an acceptable answer. Okay. So yeah, you know, another, a role model. Another that's a perfect very good answer. Another yeah. very good answer here is this. Two years ago, I had the unique opportunity to participate in Harvard Business School's peak weekend for young undergraduate women. Mm -hmm. uh, I participated in case studies. I heard lectures. I met other students and alumni. And it, it, it turned a light bulb on in me. I saw a world that I didn't really know existed. I didn't know much about that world. And I know that that's something I want to be part of in the future. Okay. So would you think, but then, John, do I not need to tie that in with the career I want to have as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, th I, th I think you can. Okay. I, I, I absolutely. But I, but I think the fact that you had this connection uh, two years ago, which is not something that a lot of people have, is a natural entry point into the question okay. why I want an MBA. Because you got a taste of what it can be. Yes. And you know that combined with your science background, it will lead you to a career that you want. Okay. Okay. okay, I've got just a couple of more questions. Could you could you tell uh, the world at large what a hackathon is? Could you explain that to your uh, classmates yes. who don't know, or maybe to their parent, the, the parents of your classmates who don't know? Yes, um, a hackathon is a competition where random teams come together. They have a very finite amount of time, twenty four hours or forty eight hours to produce an answer to this question. And this usually involves coding, data analysis, and presentation skills. So in 48 hours or 24 hours, teams need to, at the end, present. Well, okay, this is another one of their typical questions. What role do you typically play in a hackathon as a team member? This is a great question. It depends on the team. Um, because the teams are not picked beforehand, or at least I like to enter alone and pick a random team. Um, I can be quite versatile and I like to play to other people's strengths. So usually the person with the least coding skills will be project manager and work on PowerPoint presentations, which is a very important skill. And then- Yeah, but that's a nice way of saying that's what the dummies do. They make the charts. No, but I disagree with you. I think because, I, <laughs> no, no, it's, it's the truth. Right, I, you know something, I concede. I, I was just trying to make a joke. You, you okay. really know. Um, there, if I, and, and again, to close off, they're a lot of fun. You don't sleep for two days. You eat a lot of crisps. They're a I, lot I, of fun. I, I get all that, yeah. Uh, and it's the, the question, yeah, but the real question was, could you describe what it is to someone who doesn't know? That's, that's how their minds work. That's what they're trying to test here. You know, okay. the fact that you, the fact you, you know, you're gaga over hackathons, that's a small plus too. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the interview isn't designed to capture that. Okay. Um, so what do you say? We're, uh, I think her 30 minutes, more than 30 minutes for a mock interview, you're only going to have 30 minutes. You, you've already had 45 or more, um, but you have a taste for what it's like. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. And really, you're a, you're a, you're a yeah. strong applicant. Do you, do you have Very any questions strong. for us? Um, should I prepare questions? This is a question to you, I suppose. Yes, yeah. you, you should. Yeah. Sometimes at the very end, uh, 
they'll this is different. They'll say, do, "Do you have any questions for me?" Uh, and sometimes you might have a question, or is there anything else you want to? There's a, a question at the end. Do you have any questions for me? There's also another question. Um, what what did you, what do you want to speak about that we haven't mentioned? Okay. So you, you need to have a lot of topics going yes. in there that you want. What, what do you think would be? A, what's a good question to ask at the end of your interview? If in fact the door opens for that, because you don't want to a ask a question that shows that you, you can find that by yourself. Yeah, you know, a, a good question to ask them is how how hard is it to um, work during your first year of business school? Or that's not a good question. That's a low pass. I could ask, because I haven't done business or finance in the past, I could say, you know, if I get in, are there any preparation courses offered um, during the deferral period? Yeah, that, that's acceptable. Um, what, what, uh, okay, yeah, what you need to do is figure out what school you're gonna be interviewed by. When that mm -hmm. school interviews you, 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 you've got to do some research on that school and just figure out some missing pieces. Like if, if you're being interviewed by a, you know, University of Michigan, like a, a perfectly acceptable question is, yeah, I've got a question for you. What, 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 should, what, what kind of clothing should I bring? It's okay. a serious question. Winter, <laughs> okay. What kind of clothing? In terms of how cold is it, you know, do you just... Oh, just I, get it. I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you're coming from, uh, yeah. well, London. Yeah, 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 yeah a, a, a different climate, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. All right. Well, hey, good luck to you. Thank you. Uh, you've got a great resume. We didn't even talk about some of the incredible things on this resume. Racing captain of the Imperial College Yacht Club team ranked top 10 tennis player in Chile, having participated in competitions in Peru, Chile, Ecuador, Colombia, and Bolivia. The fact that you speak English, Spanish, French, and Portuguese, and conversational Dutch, <laughs> uh, and it goes on and on from there. I, uh, you know, you are a very uh, high yeah, candidate. You bring a lot to the table. You've got, you you've really got some, you're a woman in, in STEM, they love that. You're, you're, uh, what is your just? What is your connection with Latin America? Your parents? Um, Latin. My dad is Chilean. There? My dad is Chilean, and my mom and is how, from Belgium. And how uh, long have you, have you ever lived in Chile? Is that the way you say it? Chile. Yes. Um, so I lived there for eight years, and then I lived in Brazil for three years, and the rest of that was in Spain. Wow. Good okay. luck to you. We, we have no doubt you're going to do incredibly well. Uh, we're cheering for you. Thank you so much. And um, I think you're going to be having some offers. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right, everybody. This is John Vernon with Poets and Quants. Thanks for watching Fridays with Sandy. <laughs>